Hello, class. This is um, my second lecture narrated PowerPoint here, going over a few basic ideas of what is slow food, which really started uh, a lot of the interest in local and sustainable uh, foods. But importantly, what makes slow food different is that taste is an important component. All right, so what I'm going to do is share my screen. Yeah, and we're going to uh, find our PowerPoint. Yeah, and play it from the start. Okay, here we are. Slow food a week two. As I had mentioned before, I think uh, this little snail, Kyochola, which is also the name for the little A with the circle that we use for email addresses. It's a snail. And uh, that is the symbol of the slow food movement. So go slow, savor food, care about where it comes from. In fact, uh, we could consider Slow Food Nation by Carlo Petrini an auxiliary textbook. It used to be the only textbook for the class, Slow Food Nation, when I first taught it 10 years ago. It's a great book to have on hand, and we'll be providing uh, some PDFs from it if you don't want to purchase it. Um, but this was translated, and the author is Carlo Petrini. So let's just step back a little bit and get into gastronomy. We're talking about eco-gastronomy. Slow food reconstructs Bria Savarin's gastronomy by acknowledging taste and pleasure as important components of the eating experience. It asserts that, I'm just hearing some crickets outside. I, it asserts that food is a thoroughly cultural product linked to issues and constraints of quality, sustainability, biodiversity, and social justice. So it's all of that. Slow food is in a sense, slowing down, stepping back, from what Petrini writes as the encroachments of globalized cheap foods and profit-driven capitalism. Slow food, this is Slow Food Street. And when I first taught the Global Learning Program, which I waxed on about uh, in our introductory uh, PowerPoint uh, voice narration, um, I took my classes, not to Florence, but to Palenzo, to Bra, where he is, Carlo Petrini, and this uh, is called Slow Food Street, something like the Mendicino, and, um, and the University of Gastronomic Sciences that he has started is in Palenzo, very close to Bra. And, um, and our first year, we had quite a few classes right in the heart of Slow Food Street. The beginning, though, is interesting. And it started in 1986 when a McDonald's wanted to come in to Rome. So near the Spanish steps in, uh, in Rome. And uh, Carlo Petrini had been meeting with a bunch of journalists and activists before this. He's a journalist. And uh, talking about the decline of Italian cuisine and French cuisine and um, fast food, replacing it. And when they heard about the McDonald's going in, he said, well, let's have slow food. So slow food was meant to be the counter to fast food to McDonald's coming into uh, Rome near the Spanish steps. The, the McDonald's went in, but it's very tiny <laughs> and it started a whole movement. 
So the movement is uh, the movement is committed to preserving food, plant, and animal biodiversity, as well as promoting high quality food production by connecting consumers with producers. And so Petrini calls this co-producers, right? So we as consumers are co-producers because we care and are invested so much in the production process. Here it is. This is the McDonald's that, uh, that, that went in. So he lost the battle, but won the war by starting this movement and what he called eco-gastronomy. Founded the movement, wrote Slow Food Nation. Uh, and as I said, he named it as a backlash to fast food, to the Big Mac phenomenon. And the pillars are good, clean, and fair. Good, clean, and fair is powerful, super powerful, because they're really tough criteria for a good food, for a slow food. It has to be good to taste. It has to be good to think. Everything about the production process, we need to know about it. It needs to be clean, clean for the environment. It needs to be fair, fair to all creatures involved in production and consumption, production and delivery of the food, much less consumption. Number one, people need enough food. They need to be able to consume. So it's hard to satisfy all three criteria. And when we were there once, we went on a field trip when we were in uh, the region of Torino where Bra is in Palenzo. And um, we went to a Barolo uh, vineyard and Barolo is a super expensive wine you know, $100 to $50,000. And then we went to a showroom that had that kind of range of wines. I mean, crazy nuts. But we got out of our little van and the students said, Gigi, what's going on here? This is like totally not slow food in Carlo Petrini's territory. Why? Because the vineyard uh, was on a super steep, steep slope and it was a monoculture. It's hardly habit creating habitat biodiversity but it's good tasting and it's fair to the laborers because they're unionized and get a very high wage, but everything else is rotten about it. And Dan was with me that very first time we taught. I taught it and he, he was on that field trip too. Slow food is take no prisoners as we learned when we were there. And that is for example, it will not accept any cheese that's not a raw cheese. Just like not interested if it's not a raw cheese. Why? Because it's too processed. Because the flavor is um, a function of the uh, thermal properties of the, uh, of the milk it itself and the whole cheese making process. And it's too far removed from the real thing, that what's missing is taste. That's kind of the logic in the slow food arguments. Way of life. So it's really about local food traditions and rekindling people's interest in the food they eat. I mean, if, depending on where you are in food wise, this is of course what I talk about in the book also. Uh, and also it reminds people how their choices affect others around the world. This, by the way, is a raw milk machine, vending machine uh, in Northern, not in his, I didn't see this. I did not find this near Torino, but I found it in uh, trekking, in uh, exploring possibilities for places to go for my field trips for the uh, global learning program, but kind of in the North and um, vending machine for raw milk. And of course it has to say, you have to boil the milk before drinking, but no one's gonna do that who goes to the trouble of getting uh, raw milk. Um, 
mindful eating, and again, good, clean, fair. Slow food also says that, yes, it answers in the affirmative to this question, place makes a difference. And, um, and uh, it's about terroir. Territory refers not only to specific geographic locations, but also to the combination of natural factors, soil, water, slope, height, above sea level, vegetation, microclimate, that gives a unique character to each small agricultural locality and the food grown, raised, made, and cooked there. You can just stick in another apostrophe right there to match that one. Okay, that's from Sander Katz on place-based food traditions. I took this picture in front of Santa Croce in uh, Florence. It was a farmer's market and here in Greece for Greek Easter when I was teaching there in a Huxley program. And so very specific tastes to the region from which it comes. Slow food says yes, it makes a difference. So good, clean, and fair, what about good? Yeah, good to taste, good to think. Carlo Petrini says, this of course is blueberries from our own blueberries. So do they make a difference? It doesn't make a difference that they're produced here. Yeah, a slow feed says, yes. So what do we mean by good? That there is pleasure involved, that is tasty, that time was taken to prepare the food. Um, Traditional wisdom and techniques were used, cultural identities preserved, knowledge preserved, flavor preserved. And uh, here's a picture of raw milk and raw milk cheeses from my sabbatical in Switzerland. This is where, where we go also for the Global Learning Program. Uh, this is a grilled eggplant and these are cheeses. Raw milk cheeses. The most famous, of course, for slow food is this one, the Casa Marzu. And the Casa Marzu is a cause celeb um, because it not only is raw, it's full of maggots. It's called the maggot cheese, but it's very tasty. I've had it. I've had it with a lot of adult beverage, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. And uh, because you can actually see the maggots sometimes jumping, mm -hmm. even though you're just really eating their excrement, but it's very tasty. And actually, it's a sheep cheese. I don't make this cheese. And it comes from Sardinia. And uh, it's banned, of course, in Italy because of these little lively microorganisms. And it's a raw cheese and all that. But everyone eats it. It's kind of, there's a black market in Casa Marzu and, and Slow Food defends it. People's right to have Casa Marzu. Provenance refers um, to the locale in which something is from. What do you know about the origins of a particular food? Terrar, territory or terrar, T-E-R-R-O-I-R, -R -R, refers more to the microclimate, the soils, um, the wa water regime used to produce a food, saying that you can taste in the tomatoes the soil from which it came. That's terrar. Knowing that it came from slave shackle labor in Florida, that's provenance. And, uh, an ex and this expose is uh, treated very well uh, here in a tomato land. Uh, Carla Petrini, though, in Slow Food Nation talks about tulips and peppers. Again, the idea of provenance and terroir, knowing where food is from and tasting uh, where food is from. Okay. What is terroir? Okay. That's what we've been talking about. Uh, and um, and it, it is, again, the tasting where food has come from. Provenance is more like knowing where the food has come from. Terra is tasting it. Taste is a function of climate, soil type, water regimes, geomorphology, and um, rock formations, 
with the mineral content and release of the minerals into the soil, you know, from the bedrock, from the wearing away of bedrock, which is how soil is formed. A lot of soil is formed, not all soil. Um, gives it taste, unique taste, unique taste to cheese, unique taste from the pasture for the animals, unique taste to wine, especially. There's a lot of literature around terroir um, for wine production, wine grapes. Like here. Oh, the Loire, Bordeaux, Provence. Okay, okay, I'll say it's Leperon. And uh, yeah, and so Terrar would say that even and in these regions that within kilometers, there's different taste, right? So there's a different Terrar, maybe a dozen different Terrars in the Loire Valley, in Bordeaux, maybe 50. We see this also in Washington state where we, we say Appalachians is kind of the legal name for basically regions in Eastern Washington and Eastern Oregon, good wine grape growing that have their own set of microclimate factors creating this unique terroir. But wine is the best example. Is it important? Is it real? I don't know. Stephen Jones, oh my gosh, I do believe you're saying, Stephen Jones, uh, I have a guest lecture from him towards the end of the class, if not the last uh, class. And he says, yeah, that there's, there's difference in weeds, in the weeds he's breeding for taste and nutrition and affordability in the Skagit Valley. And Carla Petrini says, yeah, of course it is. We've got to protect these local food production systems. I don't know. This is basil. Okay, I mentioned Casa Marzu. Here's Panna Cotta. Um, and, and you see the slow food play because there's a slow food restaurant, the slow food restaurant and slow food street. And uh, Boca de Vino, I think it's called. And um, this is Panna Cotta. And usually it's made with gelatin. Can you make a Panna Cotta without gelatin? Yeah but it's a secret. I think it has to do with egg whites actually. And so this is a quintessential slow food item where the gelatin was not used uh, here and you still get a firm, beautiful uh, baked cream dish with a caramel sauce. And in Mexico, this is from my Mexico Global Learning Program, which Dan has taught on. Also dried ant eggs and dried cockroaches, I think the eggs are in here, and then traditional cheeses from Mexico. Taste where they come from? Maybe. San Miguel, where some of the cheeses come from. Here's one of my classes, no Dan. And uh, this is actually a preserve, but we do go to a pool, well, to an agave farm. And, uh, and in this particular area of Mexico, San Miguel de Allende, which is almost at the epicenter, there is a lot of concern about provenance and terroir, a lot of good cooking, as in Oaxaca, for example, in the south. Terra Madre is a project of slow food, which brings together, uh, yeah, which brings together co-producers, producers and consumers. And you can listen to this beautiful video, watch this video, just click on it. Uh, the clean, free range eggs. Mm-hmm. So no battery cages for slow food here. Um, clean, uh, soil, air, water, humans, animals, ecologically intact. Judicious use or no use of chemicals, nothing that would harm uh, NF in a negative way um, organisms, the uh, microenvironments. Fair, yes. Reasonable prices for products sold, reasonable remuneration, wages in the food system. 
And this comes up a lot with seeds. Oopsie, 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 with seeds. We cannot ignore the, the trade in seeds and the monopoly, the concentration. We've got some readings for you, uh, for you on this. And uh, rather in the slow food sense, we need to acknowledge and respect the biological systems, economic systems, social systems, which create this supply. Mandana Shiva, vice president of slow food and a prolific writer, uh, amazing. And, um, and farming is exceptionally difficult, if not lethal, frankly, in India, when assets are being pulled out. Um, and uh, this is a result of globalization. And to a certain extent, the Green Revolution. So you'll read about this. Of course, Carlo Petrini is going to take a very hard stand on the monopolization of seed production. The seed is so important because it's really the it's really the nexus of production, isn't it? Slow food's about cultural survival. I took these pictures. This is lentils using local lentils in Ventimiglia in the set and the Italian Riviera, part of Italy, very close to the border with France. Uh, here is a woman producing coconut milk. This is in, um, this is uh, near Diani in um, Kenya, on the Kenyan coast. And I took this picture in Fort Yukon with a woman uh, preserving, um, canning uh, river salmon. And so these are culturally uh, appropriate and defining uh, foods and slow food would protect their production by um, by um, by taking them on and putting them in the arc of taste and uh, highlighting all that's important about the production process, and what their particular challenges are, and try and rally uh, support around those production systems. Yeah, everything with modern food, slow food has problems with the loss of crop diversity of varieties in particular. Why? Those are sacrificed on the altar of uniform production. And so we're actually, you're trying to erase provenance and terroir to get a consistency in your cheddar cheese, say. And slow food is trying to uh, put back those idiosyncrasies in taste and food production uh, systems with um, traditional ties. Cats, yeah. So this is in uh, in cats and talking about First Nation and uh, indigenous foods, what they were like. What's missing is, of course, sugar, processed sugar, and processed foods in general. And uh, looking at what happens in the diet when processed foods replace these. High, high processed fat, high sugar, um, whereas less of that allows for slower metabolism of nutrients and energy and a slower release into the body, suggesting that there may actually be an impact on performance also. Since 1996, more than 1,100 products from over 50 countries have been added to the international arc of taste but over 200 of these are from the US of A. So we are on board here with the edible treasures. Oh, and Dan talked about this particular kind of cheese, Ochpek cheese in Poland. Uh, it's a really good example. And so I'll let you look at that link. It's a BBC article on, um, on a slow food product, but it's really difficult, difficult to comply with the standards for what makes it actually uh, a slow food product. 
So here's the cheese and you can get it in this region, but look at all the criteria. And so people are cheating. It has to be produced between late April and early October, but only when they're not, you know, when they're, when they're actually gonna be milked, not when they're feeding their lambs. And um, is granted PDO, protected designation of origin from the European Union. This is a very special designation, kind of like a slow food assignation. Sales went up, but 60% has to be sheep milk. And I can relate to this as I'm milking my sheep and making cheese. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they, it, it, they produce so much less milk than cows. And so you can see that corners have been cut. So these are strict standards. Really about connection, yes, connecting people with their food and food traditions. And uh, there is many, many slow food. They're called convivia for convivial, convivium, convivia, that meat, and to celebrate and protect uh, slow food. Our convivia fourth corner in Bellingham consists of these uh, organizations but also uh, related uh, and other uh, organizations and entities and harvest festivals. It's very much slow food. Eat local month is September. Here's one of our students who was one of, in one of the first eco-gastronomy classes and then global learning programs to Italy. And he is now a chef. Oh, that's it. Stop, share, get out. Okay, hello class. Well, anyway, that's all I know about slow food. And uh, Carla Petrini hosted us in the first year. And then I really didn't find it as profitable, as valuable learning experience the second year. And I was a little disappointed with the sensory taste sciences there. So we switched, went to Florence, University of Florence which is the pretty legit in terms of sensory taste science, really kind of getting at this question of, really, does terroir matter? Can you taste the difference? What really is a good food? So I'll leave, I'll end there. And uh, you can tell Dan and me.